Hi everyone, welcome to today's lesson. Um, we're going to be looking at um, planes today. So it's something I talk about quite a lot during my lessons and it, it's a concept that we've covered probably in most um, different tutorials I've given, particularly if they're very uh, representational, um, the type of tutorial or classical um, sort of traditional drawing or painting because planes are a very fundamental aspect of trying to draw representationally. Um, but basically, uh, when we talk about planes um, in a drawing or in a painting, <clears throat> we're talking about the kind of flat areas of form um, that kind of relate to the light in a certain way. So if we think of a, a cube, for instance, a cube is made up Um, if we count the back planes, a cube is made up of six different planes. So I had to think about that for a bit. <laughs> so each square makes up a different facet, a different plane of the, of the cube. <clears throat> so a plane is just a flat section of the object. Um, so if we were to draw a kind of a diamond shape, something like that for instance um, or we could make it a little bit more complex <clears throat> so these two diamond shapes are also made of different planes. So in this case, these would be, this one's made of six, 12 planes in total if you count the back planes. So this object has lots of different planes. This one doesn't have loads of planes. But generally when we're drawing representationally, we draw with a single light source. So if that was outdoors, um, it might be the sun. <coughs> if it was indoors, it might be a window or a candle or in modern settings, it might just be a, a single incandescent light or a group of lights illuminating the subject. Now, the reason we like to use a single light source when working representationally, when we're drawing or painting, as opposed to kind of using multiple light sources, um, it's because it makes it much simpler to decide how dark or how light a plane should be. So if we look at this cube, the, <coughs> if the, um, light rays are coming from the right hand side above the cube, then we know that the darkest part of the visible cube is going to be the back of it. Because no light rays directly hit that part of the cube. It might not be totally black, but it's going to be very dark. Whereas the side plane might have some light rays breaking past it, so it's going to be a sort of mid-value. It's having having some light hit it, but not lots. And let's say the light's coming a bit more from above, the most amount of light is going to hit the top of the cube. So each of these planes is going to be a different value based on its relationship to the light source. The more it faces towards the light source and the closer it is to the light source, the lighter it will be. So if you can kind of either mentally or you, you can draw it in, divide your your subject, if it was say a portrait or a figure or a still life, if you can divide it into simpler planes, big flat sections that you, you divide, you kind of change into simple shapes that are all connected. All you need to do is figure out what value that particular shape is and then or relative value, or what value it is relative to the other planes. Um, so the closer it gets to the light source, the lighter it gets. Um, the more it faces towards the light source, the lighter it gets. And vice versa, things get darker as they move away from the light source. If you're able to create a sort of planal structure to your drawing, it makes it pretty easy to decide what is going to be light or dark. So if we do it with this 
this diamond. Again, if the light's coming from up here, I know without even looking at any kind of subject that looks like this diamond, I know that that plane has to be the darkest plane. And I know that of the visible planes, this plane will be the lightest plane because it faces towards the light source. This one faces away from the light source. It doesn't receive direct light. Now all the planes at the bottom are gonna be darker than the ones at the top. But as they wrap around the form, they're going to get lighter. So you can see that starts to give a sense of form to the bottom of the, the diamond. Whereas, as I say, the top is going to be uh, darker as it turns away from the light source and then get lighter as it goes towards. <clears throat> but all of those top planes, they all angle more towards the light source. So they're all generally lighter than the bottom planes. Each of them is in sequence, moving from left to right, getting lighter, but lighter within the context of this set being light and this set being dark. So... When we're thinking of simplifying um, complex forms, the reason we start to try to think about things is in terms of being planes. If I was to draw a cylinder, so a cylinder is a pretty common choice um, as a simplification or a simplified form when you're trying to represent, say, something like an arm. So when people are kind of making constructs of arms, they often make them into cylinders. So these cylinders will have a form. <coughs> Now, let's say this cylinder is being lit in the same way as these objects have been. Then again, there's going to be a point, the cylinder, we know from other videos, where it turns away from the light source. And it gets, uh, initially it's got a bed bug line, which is darker. Then it gets a bit lighter because it's got a bit of fill. top of it might be a little bit darker because say the light's coming from there. So <clears throat> this cylinder, if I was to start to try to kind of draw it in, create its form, I'm going to have to then figure out a kind of progression of light, dark to light, trying to make it turn. And it's going to take me time to create the, the kind of wrapping form of that cylinder. What can be a bit more effective um, is to, again, you can maybe start with a cylindrical shape. But let's think of it in terms of planes. So let's say it's one, two, maybe that many planes. So now they've become... <coughs> something like that. So instead of making it kind of purely curving, I'm gonna think about where the darkest planes are. So you can see that simplification of the, the cylinder um, allows us to just kind of work in big flat sections of tone rather than kind of constantly working on these, these gradual gradations. Um, and again, it's, it's the same as the idea that when you're drawing a head, you don't draw 
the specific shape of a head. <clears throat> you just draw a simpl simplified sort of approximation of that particular head. And that becomes your starting point um, for your drawing. And we're doing the same thing um, with form, with values, because we're turning what would otherwise be curved surfaces into surfaces made up of flat planes that relate to the light in a certain way. So if I wanted to get this to relate correctly to the light, all I have to do is change each band of color individually, rather than trying to constantly work on a, a gradation um, of, of value or color. Um, and it's something that it's not quite so important when you're drawing, drawing is a bit more forgiving, but when you're painting, if you imagine how difficult it is to constantly kind of create blendings, it's much harder to um, kind of create these sort of blended forms over and over again compared with just patching in big blocks of tone. When you're starting at least, once you get this uh, accurate, you can then um, smooth it out and it's a lot easier to just smooth over um, a plane or structure um, than it is to try to add kind of solidity. And that's the other thing that you get from this, you get a sense of solidity. Um, so I'm just gonna, another example I wanna look at is, or shall I say an example um, of this in practice. <clears throat> Let's think about the form of an eye. An eye is not something you necessarily think of planarly. It's a bit easier to think of something like the mass of a head as being planar. talking about the eye I'm thinking of so we're going to think about the underside of the top lid, so I've drawn it quite big here. So the top lid has an underside, the bottom lid has a top side because there's a thickness to the eyelid. So let's work plainly. So we've got one, two, three, four, six different planes there. These ones face upwards, these ones face downwards. So we're creating some planes around the outside of the eye. So I've made the, the eye a little bit more complex, you might kind of turn it into a, a sphere. Now, this probably doesn't make a huge amount of sense immediately. 
Um, but what I've done is I've tried to divide the kind of basic forms of an eye, and I've I've just I've just uh, eyeballed this, um, so it's not super accurate. It's just generally working with what I think of as the form of an eye. Now we're going to work fairly simply. We're going to say the light source is coming from above and to the left. Now the f the f the planes will start to make more sense as I draw them in. But essentially, we've got this kind of form, this wireframe almost. It's like if you're if you were sculpting or if you were creating something out of wire. These these lines make up the boundary of the different planes. So let's work the way that we were before. Which planes face furthest away from the light source? So the furthest away and, and turned most away from the direction of light are this plane here. So this needs to go dark. Now this underside of the lid is angled pretty similarly to that one. So they're going to be a similar value. Likewise, the underside of the brow also angles away in a similar fashion. So all those three planes face, face away the most of all of the different uh, planes of this eye. <clears throat> now, we then can think of this one here, the underside of the lid, as being, it's going to be a little bit lighter than that value. And the same for this underside of the bottom lid. So, let's go a little bit darker with these, just want to make sure they stay properly separated. So now these ones are going to be that dark. This one's again, make that a bit darker. This one's going to be similar to those two. I'm going to leave the eyeball till last. <coughs> because they, they uh, face away fairly, you know, they're, they're not getting much light at all, but they're getting a bit more um, they're kind of angled slightly more towards the light source. So next, it gets a little bit trickier. So of all these planes, I want to think which, which face is the most away. It's probably going to be this one faces away. This one does, but then it does kind of angle back a bit towards the light as well. And this one's similar. So I'm trying to lay down all these different values, these different planes um, as groups. I'm thinking which are all the same. Um, this is something that's really useful to do when you're painting, actually, because very often you'll have mixed up a particular color and value. And um, it's easier to put, keep that on your brush and put it everywhere that it needs to be all at the same time, rather than kind of mix that, mix a different color, go back and mix the original color again, so on. It's not efficient. Um, so these two are dark, but not quite so dark. This one's similar. <clears throat> now that's most of our really dark planes in. Um, so everything else is kind of facing towards the light, but we want to create a little bit of separation there. This is going to be our lightest plane because it's kind of opposite to those planes. These two will be very light. That one will be quite light. So this one we're going to make just a little bit darker, but not as dark as those uh, shadow planes. These ones all face kind of similar to those two, so make that a similar value. Make that similar. So that's pretty much it for those forms. I'm just going to reinforce a bit. I'm just looking at my camera and I'm not sure if it's as clear as it possibly could be. So I'm going to exaggerate some of this, make these really dark, give myself a little bit more range. 
these kind of mid shadow colors. So I really want it to be clear what's going on. <coughs> so that's a bit better. Um, so if we were to think of the the eyeball as a form as well, it, they're all going to be kind of darker, these little planes. Getting gradually lighter as it turns towards the light. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. So hopefully that kind of illuminates a bit how, why you would be thinking about things plainly. Um, that's a pretty exaggerated uh, example of that kind of drawing. I'll just put them side by side briefly. Yeah, so you can see how you can sort of transfer these concepts to something as complex as, as an iron, obviously that would shrink down, but say we were painting, each of these planes could become a brush stroke. So it doesn't have to be as specific as, you know, they're made of four points to turn into a, some kind of rectangular shape. That's just um, for the sake of this example, but generally it's just this idea of trying to split things into flat areas of tone um, because it gives structure. So this sort of drawing has a lot more structure than if I just made it really soft and fuzzy to begin with and, and just worked with a lot of blending. What students tend to do or what budding artists tend to do is, is create a lot of blendings between different forms and it can become a bit sort of confused and muddy. Um, and this is a way of simplifying and, and being a bit more assertive with the, the forms that you're drawing and the nature of their planes. Um, but yeah, that's it for today. Hopefully it was interesting. Um, it keys in quite well with the last few lessons, the portrait drawing um, series and the head structure series. So we're looking a lot at structure at the moment. It really does help your um, portrait work if you can imbue things with a sense of structure. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, hopefully you're interested. And as always, you can subscribe here um, and click through to OCAD's uh, website if you want to sign up for tutorials. Um, but that's it. I'll see you guys soon.